Our New Testament reading is found in the Gospel of Luke and the fifth chapter. Luke chapter 5. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. He sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a draught. Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night, and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word I will let down the net. And uh, And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net brake. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draft of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. It came to pass, when he was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy, who, seeing Jesus, fell on his face and besought him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And he put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will, be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. And he charged him to tell no man, but go and show thyself to the priest and offer for thy cleansing according as Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. But so much the more went there a fame abroad of him, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. And he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. It came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And behold, men brought in a bed, a man which was taken with a palsy. And they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said unto them, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. The scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answering said unto them, What reason ye in your hearts? Whither is easier, to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk? But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins. He said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy couch, and go into thine house. And immediately he rose up before them and took up that whereon he lay and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. And after these things he went forth and saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, Follow me. And he left all, rose up, and followed him. Levi made him a great feast in his own house, and there was a great company of publicans and of others that sat down with them. But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do ye eat and drink with publicans and sinners? Jesus answering said unto them, 
They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And they said unto him, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers, and likewise the disciples of the Pharisees? But thine eat and drink. And he said unto them, Can ye make the children of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. And he spake also a parable unto them, No man putteth a piece of a new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then both the new maketh a rent, and the piece that was taken out of the new agreeeth not with the old. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall be per- and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. No man also having drunk old wine straightway desireth new, for he saith, The old is better. Amen. May God bless again the reading of his holy and inspired word. Please take your Bibles and turn with me this evening to the prophet Joel, chapter 2. We'll be taking as our text, Joel chapter 2, verses 12, 13, and 14. Joel chapter 2, verses 12 to 14. We come this evening to the conclusion of a congregational day of prayer and fasting, public day of prayer and fasting, wherein we have set aside time with earnestness corporately to seek the face of God. And it's for that reason that we give ourselves to this particular text this evening. Joel 2, verse 12, Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. And rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil, who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Prayer is, all by itself, an expression of humility and dependence. We picture the suppliant with his forehead pressed upon the ground before the king, bringing, as it were, words with him, petitioning the sovereign for the needs that he has. So it is with every man and woman, boy and girl who turn themselves to the Lord in prayer. We are coming humbly. We are saying we lack. We are needy. We are asking, O Lord, to provide something for us. We are dependent upon your provision. But then we can add to that fasting coupled with prayer. And what does that do? Well, fasting, the ordinance of fasting itself, is also an expression of humility and of dependence. And so it extends, it deepens, it it enriches, if you will, the humiliation and the expressions of dependence. We We are saying, Lord, we're desperate. Our neediness has gone to such an extent that we are desperate. We are starving for God's blessing. We crave, O Lord, your blessing more than we crave our necessary food. And so that's where we find ourselves this morning. We find ourselves in a position of humility and of dependence. Our eyes turn to the Lord, craving a blessing. Notice the the context in which this comes, you'll notice in chapter 1, verse 14, 
It says, Sanctify ye a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders, all the inhabitants of the land, into the house of the Lord your God, and cry unto the Lord. Following our text, in chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, those that suck the breasts, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. And let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord. Context is one in which the people of God have been humbled before the Lord. And they are corporately crying out to him. And so our text begins. Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn ye to me with all your heart and with fasting. You remember the words of the Lord Jesus instructing his disciples about their inability to expel a demon. He said, this kind comes out only by prayer and fasting. Exasperating circumstances require earnestness. Great need requires great earnestness in seeking the face of the Lord for his blessing. So let's look together at this portion of God's word. First of all, we see turning to the Lord with the whole heart. First of all, turning to the Lord with the whole heart. Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments. Turn unto the Lord your God. All of our circumstances, all of them, this is comprehensive, absolutely all of our circumstances, God is dealing with us. God is orchestrating, God is ordering, God is bringing everything, all of the details to pass. He's dealing with us, dealing with our souls. God is at work. And that becomes especially evident in times of difficulty, doesn't it? He brings us into straits, that is, into narrow places. And those, those straits, those narrow places are like channels. What happens, children? The water in the river is broad and it's shallow. It hardly looks as if it's moving. Lazily kind of moving along, but then there comes, you know, places in the river where it's brought into a narrow portion, and perhaps it's deepened, and then the water's rushing powerfully, forcefully, and there's rapids and, and, and white that is breaking on the top, and so on. There's something powerful there. The Lord brings us into straits, into these little channels, in order to bring us to himself, to powerfully thrust us to himself. He's dealing with us. And the fact is that the whole Bible proves what this text illustrates. Namely, that when it is God's loving intention to bless us, then he will humble us and he will drive us to himself. The emphasis in this text is is turning unto the Lord, to the Lord. He will drive us to himself and turn us from our sin. What is blessing after all? How do we define blessing? Is blessing money? No. Riches perish with the using. Is blessing power and position? No. That can be lost as quickly as it's gained. The things of the world, that's not blessing. What is blessing? Blessing. For the Christian, true blessing in reality is more of God and more of his grace. That's blessing. More of God and more of his grace. What does the Bible tell us? God looks upon the humble. God is near the humble. God will not forsake the humble. God gives more grace to the humble. The Lord looks upon the contrite and broken. The fact is, that the way to blessing is this way of, of brokenness, isn't it? Of repentance, of lowliness, of humility, of dependence. 
It brings us more of God and more of his grace. Notice that in our passage, the Lord is the one who is initiating. Therefore also now saith the Lord. It is the Lord that's speaking. The Lord says, turn ye even to me with all of your heart. The Lord is the one who's initiating. He says, turn to me. He beckons us. The fact is the Lord has providentially created the circumstances of difficulty for the people of God in Joel's day. He sent his prophet to to bring the word of God to them. And the Lord is initiating everything. He creates the context and then he creates the content of his message to them. He's saying, turn to me. The fact is, they may have been tempted to run away from him. Given the circumstances, given all that God was doing with them, given their sin, their need for repentance, they would have been tempted perhaps to run from him. And the Lord initiates and says, no, no, run to me. Turn to me. And notice that the Lord not only initiates, he instructs them. He tells them how to turn. He says, in turning, turn to me with all of your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. This is how you're to come to me, with all of your heart. He goes on in the next verse, rend your heart. Rend it. Rip it in half. Break it open. Grind it up. Don't worry about tearing your garments. Rend your heart before me. Spurgeon said, the matter of the heart is the heart of the matter. You look at Isaiah 58, and there we read about fasting, and the Lord says, fasting is a time to afflict your soul, but be sure that you're not just observing the outward fast. Be sure that the fruits of repentance, of obedience, are accompanying that affliction of the soul. In other words, the Lord might humble us in our circumstances, but we need to get our heart as low as our circumstances or lower. The Lord can bring afflictions to us and we ride high in the saddle. The Lord can bring difficulties to us and we be as full of ourselves and full of our own strength and pride as ever before. Our hearts have to be brought down. It's not good enough whether through providential afflictions or through periods of prayer and fasting. It is not good enough. Our hearts must be brought low. It is a fearful thing to think that the Lord would bring such circumstances without humbling our heart. Why? Why is that fearful? Because if our heart is not humbled, our heart will be hardened. It's a fearful thing to go through the form, the outward form, without the inward reality use the illustration before of taking a hammer and pounding. You pound on, on, on a piece of, of clay, you can compact it. You can make it harder. And elsewhere, a piece of clay that's perhaps dried out or, or brittle, you hit it with a hammer and it breaks. Pray God that our heart breaks, is humbled, not hardened before him. We're to search our hearts, to rend our hearts before him. Let me give you just a tad bit of help with regards to this. To rend our hearts before him. You can ask yourself questions like this. Am I as concerned about my sin as I am other people's sin? When I get really animated, am I really animated when I'm thinking about, speaking about, addressing other people's sin? Or am I most animated when confronting my own sin? Am I energized about the external sins of people in the congregation or in the family or in the workplace more than I am energized about the secret sins of my own heart? What energizes me more? We need godly sorrow for sin. Godly sorrow for sin sorrows over sin more than over suffering. The Lord is just and right in all of his dealings with us. He's never laid a thing upon us that wasn't right. 
Are we more sorrowful for our sin than our suffering? We need to think about this, you know, as, as the prophets so searchingly do, our sins against light. The Lord says, I've sent my prophets to you and you have not listened to them. They've spoken, you've heard them, but you have not heeded them. All of us live below what we know. We all live below what we know. We sin against light. This is enough to rend our heart before the Lord. We sin against light. We also sin against love. The Lord has come and showered his love upon us. And he can come to us like he did Israel and say, how is it possible that you love me so little? How is it possible that you love me so little? When God has shown such great love to us, we sinned against love. My friends, we need to be turning to God. Everything that we are doing is utter vanity if we are not turning to the Lord. If we are not seeking his face, if we're not coming with our whole hearts before him. We have sins of omission as well. Bishop Usher, perhaps one of the most brilliant men of the 17th century. His dying words were, forgive my sins, especially my sins of omission. Things left undone. We know to do good and we don't do it. Sins of omission. And what sin of omission would be greater than our prayerlessness? We know that prayer is the breath of the Christian life. Prayer is the thermometer of the Christian life. Our prayer life is our Christian life. And therefore, whatever the status of our prayer life is, we have a barometer of exactly where we are spiritually. Where are we in secret prayer? Well, the Lord brings us to times of affliction to drive us back to the closet, to show us where we ought to have been all the time. That in secret and in the family and in the public assembly, priority ought to be given to prayer. We're needy, we're broken, we're, we're, we're dependent upon the Lord. We ought to be living as a prayerful people. And what sin of omission that we could leave off prayer and not be exercised, earnest, devoted, prioritizing prayer. Especially in the secret place. But in the, public, in the public assembly as well. You know, if prayer, is, if prayer will tell you where you are spiritually as a Christian, the prayer meeting will tell us where we are as a congregation in many ways. The priority given to prayer in the public assembly. How forgetful we are of all of the Lord's dealings with us. There's the sins of selfishness. We're so occupied with ourselves, so easily aroused when self is bumped, so slow to die to self, to sacrifice self, to give of ourselves to the Lord and to his people. Self is often placed first, and leftovers are given to others. The sins of selfishness. The Lord says we need to come to him with our whole heart. We need to come to him and rend our hearts before him. We need to be turning to him with our whole heart. We sing, we sing about this in several places, one of which is Psalm 51. We'll be singing it in a moment. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God. Thou will not despise. The fact is, my friends, that in all of our sins, we chiefly dishonor God himself. We dishonor God. That is what ought to break our hearts most. We're dishonoring him. Our sins are against Christ and his cross. And therefore, we're to humble ourselves under his mighty hand. We have sinned against God. And so... All, in all of our repenting, our repentance points to the Lord himself just as surely as the needle on the compass points north. 
Our repentance points to God first. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. We're to be turning to the Lord with our heart. And so in this season of prayer, it's culminated in a day of prayer and fasting. Pray God that our hearts are being exercised before him. Secondly, we're to turn the we're to turn be turning to the Lord with the sight of his grace. Secondly, turning to the Lord with the sight of his grace. Notice that the word notice that in verse 13 it says, and turn unto the Lord your God for those three letters, F O R, for are a pointer. He says, here's the reason you're to turn. Here's the motivation that you're to turn. Here's the, here's the drawing that will enable you to turn. God is the one beckoning us to turn to him, and he is the one revealing himself to us. It's interesting. The Shorter Catechism makes clear that the definition of saving repentance includes, this is question 87, and apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ. Saving repentance includes the apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ. You say, well, well, why is that? You would not turn. No one would turn to one that was ready to destroy him. Humble yourself here so that you can be crushed and destroyed and obliterated. Give yourself over vulnerably as as a petitioner to me that I might destroy you. We would not turn. We would run. And so the Lord rather comes to us and he assures us of a warm reception. If we turn to him truly, what is he doing? He's coming and persuading us. He's saying, turn to me. Come to me with repentance. Come to me with your sin. Why? Because this is who I am. He's persuading us of the warm reception. This is a gracious invitation to turn to the Lord. None have ever suffered loss who have run to him, who have come to him, who have cast themselves before him, who have have come filling their mouths and and their, their minds with repentance and brokenness over their sins. See this God. He's described Christian as your God. Turn unto the Lord your God. This is your God. This is not just the God of Israel. This is not just the God of the prophets. This is your God, your Father, your Lord, your Savior, your Deliverer. He is yours, and you are his. And we are told he is gracious and merciful. This is what draws us, draws us to him in repentance. There are those who want to cast dispersions and say, ah, if we speak about God being gracious and merciful, then it will be a motive to sin. Then we'll say, oh, we can take it easy. We can sin and so forth. Never, ever has that been the fruit of, go- of, of gospel faith or repentance. We're told in Romans 2 that even the goodness of the Lord is to drive us to repentance. Even the goodness of the Lord drives us to, to repentance so that the people of God see the grace and the mercy of God and it only pours oil on the fire of their repentance. They say, how is it that I have sinned against such a God as this? So graceful, so full of grace, so full of mercy. How is it that I have lifted up, as it were, my heel against him? The question is, does your view of God match the one that he has revealed of himself? Does your view of God match the revelation of God in Holy Scripture? He is gracious and merciful. He is slow to anger and of great kindness. All of this is taken, of course, from Exodus 34, where God says, I'm going to cause my glory to pass before you, Moses. And when he causes his glory to pass before him, he pronounces his name. He says, I'm going to have all my goodness pass before you. That's his goodness is his glory. And his name is pronounced as gracious and merciful and slow to anger and patient and so on, of great kindness. This is God's glory to be such a God as this, unlike the gods of this world, fickle, selfish, the gods who are full of wrath and indignation and know nothing of mercy. It says, 
of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. You say, now, whoa, 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 wait a second. God, God is described as repenting of the evil. What does that mean? Repentance, remember, means change, change of mind, change of direction. When we repent, not only is our mind, but our whole life is changed. We go from serving the devil and heading to hell to serving Christ and heading to heaven. There's a change of direction in repentance. And so when it speaks of God repenting, God doesn't change his mind, but the sinner's mind is changed, and that changes God's way of relating to him. When the sinner changes direction, God's way toward him is changed. We go from being under the wrath of God to being under the mercy of God at conversion. And in all of our repentance, we're being brought under the the banner of his love. And so genuine repentance includes a firm confidence, a belief, a persuasion in God's mercy. Remember in Psalm 130, if God should mark our iniquities, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. There is forgiveness with the Lord that he may be feared. His forgiveness induces godly fear. We see that we have been an ungrateful people. Look at our ingratitude. All that he's given to us, we've scorned, we've spurned, we've neglected. All that he's given to us. And the tears which fall from our eyes, those tears are sweet droplets to the Lord. They're full of sweetness like honey to the Lord. They're precious to him. He prizes them. We see our sin in light of the cross, and our hearts are broken. Ah, here's the cost of my sin. Here's here's what my prayerlessness cost. Here's what my selfishness has cost, my unbelief, my pride. All of the violations of God's commands, they cost this. A perfect Lamb of God laid upon the cross. We see our sins in light of the cross, but you know the Lord sees our sins in light of the cross as well. And hence, he is able to be gracious and merciful to us. His son has made a full provision for that sin and forgiveness. And that means that for the Christian, our days of mourning are temporary. They're limited. But the fruit is eternal. We mourn for a brief season, but we reap all of the fruit forever. The, eternal, the fruit is eternal. The oil of joy is poured into the broken heart and it fills to overflowing forever the people of God so that on the last day he wipes away every tear from our eyes himself and we enter into the joy of the Lord and we have perpetual depths of limitless joy for all of eternity and so we turn to the Lord with this in in light of his grace, the sight of God's grace. Thirdly, notice God's returning to us with a blessing. God's returning to us with a blessing. Who knoweth, verse 14, if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. When we rend our hearts, God will rend the heavens and come down with mercy. We rend our hearts in repentance. He rends the heavens and comes down with mercy. God acting in favor toward us. Now this expression at the beginning of verse 14, who knoweth if he will return, does not express something that's doubtful. It's not saying, well, we're, we're, we're doubtful about this, but it is rather an appropriate expression of humble hope. There's a confidence, there's a hope, as you see in what follows, but there's a humility in it. It's not coming and saying, we deserve, we earned, we are owed this out of the other thing, but rather we're coming in that same spirit of humility and dependence and expressing our hope to him. And you say, what blessing does the Lord give? Well, it's described here 
as even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. That meat offering and drink offering is the fruit of the earth. The Lord lavishing upon his people temporal blessings that would have been gathered for God's altar. The people of God have been humbled. Things have been taken away from them in terms of gospel ordinances. And the Lord is saying, you, you humble yourself before me. Who knows? The Lord may grant a blessing and provide those ordinances uh, to you and, and for you. You see, the great concern of the people of God was not their tables, but God's table. Their great concern was God's table. And so it is in true repentance. We're not just coming and saying, Lord, we have a need that we want you to fix, and you are the means to serve our end. But rather, we're coming to the Lord and saying, Lord, we need to be fixed. To the, as a means to the end of your glory. And you've set about fixing us, both in breaking us as well as blessing us, in driving us to yourself. They're concerned not about their tables, but God's table. You think of Hezekiah when he's recovered. He's sick. He says, what sign? Well, the sign was tied to when he would be going up to the house of God. Not when he was going up to his own bed. Not when he was going up to his, his uh, outing or chariot. But up to the house of God. In Isaiah 38, we see that. And so, what, what, what blessing is there? The, the greatest blessing of all is the plentiful enjoyment of God's ordinances. This is the greatest desire to be, this is the greatest blessing to be desired. We sing about it in the Psalms. One thing have we desired of the Lord, to behold his beauty, uh, to be in his temple all the days of our life. This is what we desire more than anything. This is, this is the greatest of all blessings, the enjoyment of God's ordinances. And the Lord says, this is the blessing I'll give. I may give you the temporal blessings that will enable you to have the spiritual blessings. The fact is that all other blessings flow after this. If we get the spiritual, if we get the Lord and his grace, then we get everything else ever wanted or needed. The Lord says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and I'll add all these other things unto you. He who did not spare his own son, will he not also with him also freely give us all things? What's needed is the Lord. We need more of God and more of his grace, and in having that, we have everything. And everything else follows in its train. And so you look at what comes after this. In verse 18, Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. The Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith. He goes on to speak about all of these other blessings that he would send. He says in verse 21, Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, verse 23, Be glad then, rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately. Verse 25, we could go on and on. I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, and the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer room, my great army which I sent among you. He's saying all the losses, I will grant all of that, recover every bit of that, and heap more on top. I'll restore all of the, all of the years that the locusts have eaten. You see the Lord bringing blessing. This is, the, this is the Lord's way. We see the same thing in the New Testament. 1 Peter 5. The Lord comes through Peter and he says, listen, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And he says, be clothed with humility. God will give more grace to the humble. You are guaranteed more grace if you humble yourself under the mighty hand. What does he say? If you humble your, yourself... Under the mighty hand of God, he will exalt you in due time. He will exalt you. You will be exalted. It's for certain. He will shower blessings upon you. And so immediately does he say, same sentence, cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Humble yourself, he'll exalt you. Cast your cares, he cares for you. All these things are put together. 
God's intention is loving. He puts us in a strait in order to drive us faster to himself. He says, well, not enough prayer. We need to recover the spirit of prayer. My house must be a house of prayer. I'll set my people praying. In Egypt, he sent them down to Egypt. What did they do? They cry out to the Lord. They're busy praying to him, and he delivers them from under the boot of Pharaoh. During this period of the judges, he sends trials upon them. They cry out to the Lord. They set about praying. The Lord delivers them. He exalts them in their humbled position. Well, the Lord has set us about crying out to him, hasn't he? The Lord has dealt with us as a congregation, and he has humbled us, and he has set us crying. It is God's loving intention. Blessing must follow brokenness. And so if you want the blessing, you cannot spurn or do an end run around the brokenness. We must grasp the nettles. We must humble ourselves before the Lord if we're to be exalted by the Lord. We must repent and search our hearts and rend our hearts and say, we're not playing games here. You know, we're not going through emotions here. You know, we're not busy just maintaining some, you know, esoteric historic positions that have been maintained by the church in the past regarding worship or other things. This is not a social club. We are in dead earnest. We are serious, sober, exercised earnest about the things of God and his glory. We realize that time is exceedingly short. We realize that our, our, our moments are brief upon this earth and that whatever time God gives us needs to be devoted fully and comprehensively to the pursuit of his glory. And the Lord says, I'll help you to that end. If that's your desire, then I will do what is necessary to bring that to pass. And so as God's people, we come in just as they did in the days of Joel. And the Lord is saying, come, come to me, turn to me, turn unto me. Come with your fasting in your mourning, come with all of this brokenness. Make sure that your heart is chief, that you're rending your heart. I am a God who is delighting in goodness and grace. I delight in showing mercy to my people. I delight in the brokenness of your heart. So you think back over this day of prayer and fasting. Everything that, that you were about, and not only you, but those who have joined us elsewhere. And I thought about this throughout the day. It was rising like a great incense before the Lord, a sweet-smelling savor to him. Here is the Lord looking upon his people, and their hearts are broken before him, and they're releasing, as it were, wafts of sweet fragrance. And the cries of our hearts have been going heavenward. Is it in vain? Is this all idle? Are we just busy, you know, seeking the Lord and the heavens are brass? No. The Lord comes and says all day long he's been receiving all of these petitions that have been raised heavenward. And he's saying to us, I am a God who is full of grace. I'm gracious and merciful. I'm slow to anger. I have great kindness. I repent of you. I delight to bless my people, to restore the years that the locusts have eaten. And so we go away at the end of this fast day assured God has heard our cry. We began on purpose with those words from Psalm 116 in the opening of our service. I love the Lord because my prayer. He hath heard. The Lord's heard our prayer. The Lord has graciously received it. And the Lord delights for us to come to him. This is where he wants to keep us, to, to be, as it were, leaning upon him, depending upon him, crying out to him, in earnest seeking him, to be a people who in our brief span live for his glory, spend ourselves for his glory. And so thirdly, we see in verse 14, God's returning to us with a blessing. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. He will exalt you in due time. Stand for prayer. O oh, gracious and loving God in heaven, who are we as a people to be able to offer so willingly of this sort? 
and to lift our petitions heavenward with any hope of having them received, reaching the throne of heaven. And yet you, O God, have assured us we have an advocate within, the Spirit, who even in our stammering enables us to pray with the Spirit of grace and supplications. And we have an advocate in the throne room, Jesus Christ the righteous, who mingles all of our prayers with his own mediation, so that even as we pray, O Lord, in our feebleness and brokenness, we're assured that our prayers indeed not only reach heaven, but that you, O God, hear them, receive them, prize them, love them, and that you are pleased, O Lord, to grant us the blessings that we ask for. We desire chiefly more of yourself, Give us more of yourself, we pray, and more of your grace. With this we would be content to be able to behold your beauty all the days of our life, that this pilgrimage and sojourning, with all of its pain and heaviness, manifold temptations and afflictions, might be nevertheless spent basking in the light of your countenance. So, O oh Lord, spare us Visit us with mercy. Remember, O Lord, the petitions raised heavenward this day. Grant us above and beyond all that we have asked, all that we could imagine, all that we could think. Give us above and beyond. Restore the years that the locusts have eaten. And enable us, O Lord, even in physical needs, things like health, that like the drink offering and the meat offering, that we would use even our bodies as you give them strength, chiefly to the end of your service and the advance of your, your, your praise. So, Lord, we look to you in all of this and ask it in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Let's sing together from Psalm 51, verses 16 to 19. Psalm 51, 16 to 19, the tune is St. Mary, which is tune number 120. Psalm 51, verse 17, a broken spirit is to God a pleasing sacrifice, a broken and a contrite heart, Lord, thou will not despise. He goes on, show kindness and do good. O Lord, to Zion, thine own hill, the walls of thy Jerusalem build up of thy goodwill. Verses 16 to 19.
for the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Amen.